God bless you. We bring you greetings in the most holy name of the Lord Jesus Christ from Chosen Generation Church of Jesus Christ. We want to reach out, amen, to one and all today with the word of God, but we want to say to our subscribers, we do thank you for coming on board. We bless God for those that have joined us and it's really supporting this ministry, praise God. And the beauty of it is, is that each time someone subscribes, that means that you have access to the ministry. You can be blessed of God. And you can tell others about what the Lord is doing, amen, because our mission is to bring you into the kingdom of God before the church age end, meaning before we've taken out of the earth. God's going to take his kids out of this earth, amen, because he's going to destroy this place. But it's going to be a series of judgments, amen. It's not going to happen just overnight uh, once the peace system is set up. Uh, and actually it's being set up right now, but once the Antichrist, which is the beast, reigns, amen, God's going to plague everyone to take on the mark of the beast. So although it's going to be presented as though a, a means of prosperity, uh, God's going to punish everyone that partakes of the mark of the beast. Amen. Because the mark of the beast simply means you have denounced Christ. It means basically you have told God this is it, that you're going to join league with Satan, with the devil, and then you're going to end up going where the devil is, has been destined for him to go, which is hellfire. Amen. For hell was prepared for the devil and his angels. And I know in most cases when people listen to uh, ministers of the gospel, they very seldom talk about the judgment of God. But this is the reason why Jesus hung on the cross so that we could escape the judgment of God. Amen. It wouldn't be a four complete message if we only told you about heaven and not tell you about hell. Jesus hung on the cross. Amen. Paying, praise God, the penalty for our sins so that we would not suffer throughout eternity in hell fire. He provided a way that we may have eternal life and that we may have life and that more abundantly. That we may be in the presence of God where there's fullness of joy. And as the word of God said, his right hand are pleasures forevermore. Amen. He made it possible for us to partake of the tree of life. Amen. He made it possible. Praise God. So the balance of the message is we got to forewarn those that have not given their life to Jesus that they're going to face the judgment of God if they choose not to follow him. And those that choose to follow the Lord Jesus Christ would truly be rewarded with eternal life. They're going to have life in that more abundantly. Amen. So we got to uh, point those things out to you. I wouldn't be a messenger of God. I wouldn't be a uh, one sent by God if I didn't tell you these things. Amen. So let's turn to... Um, the book of Romans, uh, we're going to look at the, uh, I believe I want the eighth chapter, and let's pick it up at verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now, one thing about it you will see in your in your King James Version of your Bible, uh, you will see the word spirit there capitalized. Yeah, but when you look at it closely, God is talking about that new creation inside of you. He's talking about that new spirit that's created after God in righteousness and in true holiness. When you pray, uh, when your spirit prays, amen, because you are now in the kingdom of God, it has a direct communication with God. Your spirit and God's spirit becomes one. There is a, a fusing there. There's, as the Bible says, he that have joined himself unto the Lord has become one spirit. Amen. So then we can speak of uh, God's spirit, although we're speaking of your spirit, because the spirit of God is one with your spirit when you're born again. Amen. There's a direct communication. And your spirit not your, not your mind, not your intellect, can make groanings to God, can make, make uh, 
communication to God, amen, that cannot be spoken by your natural understanding. Amen. Praise God. So the intercession that we look at is mainly that inward man communicating with God. Amen. Keep reading. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. I tell you what, let's let's read give me twenty five as well. Give me let's go back back a little bit. We're at twenty six. So you you read twenty six or you what first you read? Twenty six. So give me twenty five and, and then twenty six and twenty seven. But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. Likewise the spirit also help with our infirmities. Yes. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. Yes. But the Spirit itself make an it in intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit. The message today is he that searches the hearts. Really, we talk about God. He that searches the heart knoweth the mind of the Spirit. Now, though you see Spirit capitalized there, you have to make a distinction when the Bible says he that knoweth the mind of the spirit. God's not talking about himself. He's talking about knowing your spirit, knowing what's going on inside of you. He knows the mind of the spirit. Praise God. He that searches the heart knoweth the mind of the spirit. Praise God. So there's some things when you pray from your intellect, a lot of times that's where we start. We don't mean to, but that's just how we start off, praying from our intellect, talking to those that are in the kingdom, those that are truly uh, born again. We start off most of the time praying from our intellect before our spirits would take over. You know, the scripture tells us to believe not every spirit, but every spirit that confess that Jesus has come in the flesh is of God. Guess when your spirit begins to confess that Jesus have come in the flesh. It would take place from the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit is given to you, God gives you utterance. And guess who's what's praying at that moment? Your inward man. That new man begins to pray because God grant that new man a power of utterance. As the Bible says, that we speak in tongues as the Spirit of God give us utterance. But what God's giving utterance to? The inner man. The new spirit that God has given you begins to talk to God. And when he's talking to God, he's confessing that Jesus has come in the flesh. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The day, praise God, see, if somebody can stand before an altar and confess that Jesus is coming to flesh from the intellect, and it doesn't really mean nothing. It doesn't mean that they got saved. They could be just repeating what somebody told them to say. But when your spirit confesses, then the spirit of God must be involved in that. The spirit of God must be involved in that. When your spirit confess that Jesus has come in the flesh, praise God, that's when the new spirit and God's spirit is made one. Because when the spirit of God is given to you, it comes as a package. When the spirit of God comes, like on the day of Pentecost, on that day they was given a new heart, a new mind, a new spirit, and God's spirit. All in one package, which we call the born again experience. The born-again experience consists of a new heart, new mind, and a new spirit in God's spirit. But as the scripture says, when one joins himself unto the Lord, they become one spirit. And this is why Elijah uh, had uh, someone to ask him the question about can they receive a double portion of his spirit. He would say, why do you want Elijah's spirit? Well, they have, Elijah's spirit was to have the spirit of God because Elijah's spirit was one with the spirit of God. That's why he made the statement. The, the one that would, would be the protege said, I want a double portion of your spirit. And God even let Moses know, I'm going to put your spirit, telling Moses, upon the 70. But what you mean your spirit, Lord? Do you mean Moses' spirit? Or do you mean the spirit of God? Because Moses' spirit 
was fused with the spirit of God. To receive Moses' spirit was to receive the spirit of God. The same way that the, the protege of, of Elijah wanted to have a double portion of his spirit. Because a double portion of his spirit would be a double portion of the spirit of God. Just trying to give you some understanding by looking at some other uh, places in scripture to help you to understand when we look at, amen, that the spirit maketh intercession for us. With groanings that cannot be uttered. Do you know when you speak in tongues, that is your inner man speaking? That is your newborn spirit speaking. But the spirit of God has given utterance to that new spirit is inside of you. That the inner man begins to communicate with God and the outer man is left not understanding what's being said. Because to your outer man or to your natural uh, or to, uh, to, to your mind, is, 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 it becomes unfruitful because you don't understand what you're saying. You don't know what you're saying, but you're talking in the spirit. Bob said, if any man speak in an unknown tongue, he speaketh unto God, not unto men. Because when he speaks in that heavenly language, that language, praise God, does not gel with your intellect, with your natural mind. In other words, you don't know what you're saying. Praise God. It's unfruitful to your natural mind. Your natural mind don't pick up on it. But your inner man, your innermost being is talking to God. Because you're a new creation. That new creation will talk to the one that created him. Praise God. Because you're a new creature. The new creation brings a new language. The new creation will bring a new utterance. Praise God. Because you're a new creation, you come with, it comes with a new language, which some will call speaking in tongues. Praise God. You're speaking to God from your new creation. And you're interceding at the same time with groanings that can't even be uttered. You're interceding at the same time. Praise God. Hallelujah. And you make an intercession where you can't truly pray as you would from the intellect, but you can pray from your spirit. And the Bible even tells us, amen, to, uh, to build ourselves up in our most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Not praying in the intellect, but praying in the Holy Ghost, meaning that, your, that new creation can pray. Because you have a new, amen, language that comes with the new creation. Amen. So let, let's just, uh, just want to point out some things, lay some things down as a foundation before we go in a little deeper. But let's go to the book of uh, Genesis. Now, he that searches the heart knoweth the mind of the spirit. We're talking about prayer. We've been on prayer for a while. We're still talking about prayer now. Amen. But we're looking at, praise God, how God, amen, looks at the heart. When we are praying, a lot of times we don't know that God's not looking at what you formulate in words for a request. He is searching the request out based on your heart. God can interpret what you would say and can't say by just giving you what the heart is saying. Praise God. As Solomon said, uh, that if you did make the Lord your delight, he'll give you the desires of your heart. Solomon prayed and talked to God, never really told God everything he wanted. He, he, he asked for wisdom, he asked for knowledge, but he wanted more than that. And God knew it. And because God searches the heart, God could say to Solomon that basically, I'm going to give you more than what you ask. Not just wisdom, not just knowledge, but I'm also going to give you wealth. I'm going to give you honor. I'm going to give you a lot of things that you didn't ask for because God knows the heart. God knows what the man really wanted, and God gave it to him, even though he never really requested. See, you can receive from the Lord beyond request because he's looking at the heart. You was not able to pray successfully. What you wanted to say to God, but because God, amen, searches the heart, he can give you exactly 
what you stand in need of. Though you don't even have the ability to tell him what you need or what you want, you still can get it. Let's look at the book of Genesis, the 18th chapter. And let's look at uh, verse 17. And the Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? Now, the beauty of this whole story, when you read the 18th chapter, amen, God basically had uh, lunch with Abraham, praise God. God came down, amen, uh, in a theophany, which means in another form, came down to talk to uh, Abraham and had two angels with him. And God had, had basically had, had dinner with or lunch with Abraham. We can read about this as we read the 18th chapter in its uh, totality. If you read the whole chapter, you see how God met with Abraham on the plains of memory, praise God, with two angels with him. And then the angels set their face towards Sodom and Gomorrah. They departed, but the Lord stayed with Abraham. Abraham, when God came, looked like three men appeared. Uh, Abraham, praise God, knowing who what was going on, Abraham bowed himself because he knew he, who he's dealing with. He knew these wasn't just three men. Praise God. But one of them was the Lord and two of them was his angels. You know, something about, about the Bible shows us patterns. When Jesus ascended, amen, after resurrecting from the dead, he was ascended back to heaven. There was two angels standing right there. Praise God. It's, it's something how we see sequence. Now God is talking to Abraham, if you read the 18th chapter in his beginning, and he had two angels with him, just as it were when Jesus came in the flesh, amen, crucified, resurrected, and when he ascended up to heaven, there was two angels right there, which told the apostles, while you're gazing into heaven, that same Jesus, praise God, that ascended, is coming back in like manner. Praise God. But go ahead and read, read. Read that verse again, 17. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? Now, let, let's go to the 23rd verse. And Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? The thing that God was saying to Abraham, Shall I hide that which, which I'm going to do, is that he came... And sent his angels of wrath to Sodom and Gomorrah to destroy it. And he knew this would be a great concern of Abraham. Why? Why would this be a concern of Abraham? We're going to get into why. But Abraham had great concern about the welfare of Sodom and Gomorrah. And God knew he would have it because God searches the heart. See, God knows exactly, praise God, how to address things and how to enter into a conversation with us because he knows our heart from the onset. He knew that Abraham would be very concerned about the welfare of Solomon Gomorrah. So he said, shall I hide this thing that I'm about to do? Now remember, praise God, as, as written in the scripture that the Bible said, surely the Lord God would do nothing, but he reveals his secrets unto his servants, the prophets, praise God. Hallelujah. Abraham, praise God, have a place with God as the prophets had. And God was not about to do anything except he make it known. Praise God to his servants, the prophets. You know, God uh, told one man that had took Sir, uh, the wife of Abraham from him, which was Abimelech. God told this man that Abraham is a prophet. God told Abimelech that. He said the man is a prophet. And the man then told God, said, you know, out of the innocent of my hands, I've done this. Did not the man tell me this was his sister? He said, you know, it wasn't my purpose to take his wife from him. He didn't tell me he had a wife. But God said, I knew that. That's why I kept you from touching her, in other words. But he said, release that man, his wife, though. Because God told him, say, you're but a dead man because you have another man's wife. That's how God feels about that. That's what God told him. He took Abraham's wife out. And this, this was not, uh, it was innocent on his part because Abraham lied. Abraham basically lied. <laughs> he said, that's my sister. What made it a lie was 
she was his sister, but the lie was when you try to when you tell somebody something that to to, uh, to deceive them, it becomes a lie. In other words, he didn't explain the situation fully, <laughs> so he didn't say it enough to make sure his nick wasn't going to be on the line. Now we tell the, what they call white lies. It's a lie altogether. A lie, black lie, white lie, still a lie. <laughs> we deceive people, and we think, well, I didn't lie. I did tell them, you know. No, you, you deceive them because you know they didn't quite understand what you were saying, and you utilize their lack of understanding to get your way. But Abraham could have told the man, she's my sister and wife, which would have been the truth, but he just said, this is my sister. She wasn't just his sister. She was his wife. That's the part that made it a lie. But, but go ahead. So God, so God understands this man's going to be concerned about the welfare of, so, of Solomon and Gomorrah, and we're going to get into it, into the why. But go ahead and read. Finish reading. Go back to 23. And Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Yes. Now, right. see, Abraham is, here, here's the thing. Abraham says some righteous folk down there. There's some righteous folk down there in Solomon and Gomorrah, but who are these righteous people? His nephew. His nephew is down there. And Abraham at the time regarded Lot, his nephew, as he regarded his own son. At the time, he had no son. But Abraham handled Lot like a son. And, in, and to show you that Abraham handled this man like a son, when Abraham and Lot was dwelling together, they was very prosperous. They started multiplying and in, 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 in stock and in in, in, in their... Their, um, their stock was growing in terms of their cattle, and they had servants, both both uh, Abraham and Lot, and they kept prospering so greatly that after a while, their servants began to strive one with another because the land couldn't hold them. And Abraham said to Lot, you choose whatever you want. If you go to the left, I, I'll go to the right. If you go to the right, I'll go to the left. Basically, he's telling them, say, you can choose the best, and I'll take the, the least. Or less. That's how a father deals with a son. He wants the son to have more than what he would have. And so Lot chose Sodom and Gomorrah because it was very uh, rich, sore, and, and wealth, wealth, you know, wealthy in, in, in its uh, in, in terms of, uh, of what it has to offer. And Abraham let him have the best. But he chose a place that was wicked, though. Chose a place that was wicked. Keep reading. Peradventure there be fifty righteous within the city. Will thou also destroy and not spare the place for the fifty righteous that are therein? Guess what? The reason why we're coming here is that Abraham never specifically said anything about Lot. The point I'm making is that Abraham never uttered out of his mouth Lot, his wife, his children, but yet God who searches the heart. No, this is exactly what he's saying. When he said if there be 50 righteous, he's only concerned about Lot and his family. But yet he never uttered this to God to show you that God, and I'm going to show you later on how God responds to this man's request. This man never actually tell God anything even close to saying that I'm talking about Lot. He didn't say it. If there be any righteous. Now this is a maybe. If there be. Be it far from you to destroy the righteous with the wicked. Keep reading. That be far from thee to do after this manner. To slay the righteous with the wicked. Yes. And that the righteous should be as the wicked. Mm -hmm. That be far from thee. Keep reading. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right. Now look how he's challenging God. You're a righteous judge. Shall not the judge of all the earth. And it also showed you his understanding of who he's dealing with. He knows that God is the controller of all things. He understands who God is. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right. Let's go to the 19th chapter. And let's look at the 27th verse. 19 and 27. And Abraham got up early in the morning to the place where he stood before the Lord. Now, we're just coming to the conclusion of what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah. 
the two angels went down there. And, of course, you know, if you read the whole, the details of the story, Lot sees the angels out there. And he, the angels want to sleep out, not really sleep, but they want to hang out in the street. And Lot lets them know, oh, you can't do that. It's like being in, in, in South, uh, the south side of Chicago. You can't hang out here all night. You can't do that. Or, or being in, let's say, Brooklyn, New York somewhere, or somewhere uh, uh, in the Bronx of New York and, and think that as a stranger, you're going to hang out there all night. You don't want to try that because you know what kind of people that dwell in Sodom and Gomorrah. But you, you should wonder why would the angels want to be out in the streets? They didn't come to lounge in Lot's house. They wanted to be out in the streets because they came to rumble. Praise God. They came for a rumble. <laughs> they wanted these people to break bad with them because they came to destroy them. There was angels of wrath sent to bring judgment upon Sodom and Gomorrah because of their sins. And do you think for one minute that God's going to let any nation live like Sodom and Gomorrah and not destroy it? You must don't know who God is. That's why we have a time set for the, un the ungodly to, 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 amen, where God will visit their iniquities and God will punish them for their sins. There's a time set for them. They just don't know it. They think they're getting away. But they may be getting by, but they will never get away. Because that's how God operates. It will come a time when God will visit. And we got the book of Revelations to show you that he's going to visit this world for their sins. We got the book of Revelations to reveal that to us. The day of wrath. The day of wrath. But look at how uh, God deals with this. Keep reading. And he looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah, and toward all the land of the plain. And behold, and lo, the smoke of the country went up as the smoke of a furnace. Because God roasted and toasted that place. Fire and brimstone came down, and God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. And all of this was for an example for those that would later live ungodly. To let them know that God is nobody to play with. That's what Peter uh, revealed to us in his epistle, and also Jude in his epistle. Keep reading. And it came to pass, when God destroyed the cities of the plain, that God remembered Abraham. Now watch this. God is going back to the prayer of Abraham. And God remembered Abraham. And what did he do in remembering Abraham? And sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow. So to remember Abraham was to deliver Lot. God delivered Lot because he remembered Abraham. Praise God. But Abraham never said anything about Lot because God searches the heart. Praise God. He don't need Abraham to tell him, I want Lot to be rescued. His heart is saying so. Every time he said, if there be 50, praise God, in this city, amen, if there be 50 righteous, would you spare the city? And he got all the way down to 10. If there be 10 righteous, God said, if I can find 10 righteous, I would spare the city. But all he was looking at was Lot. And the angels came, praise God, to bring judgment upon Sodom and Gomorrah. But they said something that we need to underline. The angels told Lot and his family, we can do nothing until we get you out of here. Because God has not appointed us, his people, his children, unto wrath, but unto salvation. See, God has appointed us unto deliverance. So the angels said, we got to deliver you, though we're going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Because God has not appointed us unto wrath. But unto salvation through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And though they came to destroy Solomon Gomorrah, Solomon Gomorrah could not be destroyed until Lot and his family was taken out of it. And God cannot destroy this earth until he takes the church home and out of the earth, praise God. 
And then when God takes the church out of the earth, praise God, then fire and brimstone can come upon this earth. And the wrath of God can be poured out to the uttermost. But he got to first get us out of here, praise God. He got to get us out. And until God get the church out of the earth, this earth is going to remain. God cannot destroy this earth as he would if we're still here. Because why? We are the salt of the earth. We are the purifiers. We are the reason why God is still dealing with this earth. Because we, though the earth be rotten to its core, Amen. God has some purification here. He has us here to purify this earth. Amen. As long as we're here, the earth remains purified. But once God takes us out of the earth, as, as he removed the salt of the earth out of the earth, then the earth will be appearing to God as rotten as it is, and God will wipe it out. But God searches the heart, praise God. We're supposed to be praying for salvation while we're here. Abraham prayed for the salvation of Lot and his family, praise God, that they would be spared. You that have given your life to Jesus Christ, have you prayed that God spare anybody? Or you just, you know, down here like this is a, a miracle round or this is an amusement park and you just getting on all the rides, just enjoying all the pleasures of this life, but not concerned about who dies and go to hell. Why are you down here? You're supposed to be praying like, 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 like Abraham prayed. Praying that God, amen, would, would praise God, rescue some folk, praise God, and bring them into the kingdom of God. That God, amen, would work on hearts and minds and cause people to repent of their sins and be baptized in Jesus name and give their life to the Lord Jesus Christ and receive the outpouring of the Holy Spirit are you praying like that there's, there's a prayer that God will hear more than any other prayer and that's the prayer of salvation Abraham was praying for salvation God had to hear that prayer who are you praying for mothers are you have enough sense to pray for your children? Fathers, do you have enough sense to pray for your children? Amen. You that's in the kingdom of God, do you have enough sense to pray for those that are lost around you? Praise God. God searches the heart. Praise God. He searches the heart. Amen. He's awaiting for us to request deliverance for others. He's awaiting. But he that searches the heart knoweth the mind of the spirit, praise God. Hallelujah. We're supposed to be praying for the salvation of souls. If we can't pray nothing else, that's one thing we should be praying. You may want a lot of things from God, but how many people do you want to be saved? How many people have you approached God about in concerning their salvation? I know you may be facing a lot of things in life and some things you want changed, but I, I guarantee you, if you focus on salvation of souls, I'm talking to the believer, talking to those that have given their life to the Lord Jesus Christ, I guarantee you God will take care of your natural needs. If you could just focus on the salvation of souls, God would grant you your every desire if you go after his desire. Because his desire is to see people born into the kingdom of God. There's two prayers that I know that God will hear. One is, if you pray for the salvation of souls, God is listening to you. You got his attention. The next prayer is, if you will pray that God send laborers. Because Jesus said, pray unto the Lord of the harvest that he might send laborers. That was a request from uh, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He said, pray for laborers. Pray for those that will go forth and bring people into the kingdom of God. We don't have enough people doing that. Pray for laborers. For the harvest is plenty. But the laborers are few. 
Those are two prayers for sure that God would answer you. And in those two prayers, if you pray and concern yourself about the things that God is concerned about, then God will take care of everything that you may be concerned about. I tell you what, if you go after the things that's dear to God's heart, there's no way in this life that God will not take care of the things you stand in need of. But you got to go after the things that's dear to his heart. Those that focus on salvation is more likely to have visitations from the Lord. They're more likely to have a, a fellowship with God that's beyond words. They're more likely. They're more likely. Why do you think the apostles had God talking to them directly and angels showing up to rescue people like Peter being apprehended for preaching the gospel? Then an angel is sent to release him from prison. Why do you think all that took place? Because Peter had centered his heart on the salvation of souls. And anybody that does that is going to have visitations from God. Visions, dreams come with all of those things. Peter on the, the rooftop praying and God shows him all these four-legged beasts and tells him to, to slew and eat them. And he said, I have not eaten anything unclean from my youth. But God was talking about nations. And the eating was mainly to fellowship and partake with the body of Christ. Because God was going to bring the nations into the kingdom of God. He was given a revelation to Peter that he's going to save outside of the Jewish family. Outside of Israel. And save the nations that he may fulfill what he promised to Abraham. Praise God. That in thee shall all the nations be blessed. Which will be through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Through the Messiah. All the nations. Through Messiah Jesus will be blessed. Amen. But when you look at it. All the things you've seen that God did for the apostles. That was very, very uh, moving. In terms of their relationship with God. Was because these people were centered on salvation. Why do you think that John... Uh, got all this revelation from God. Because John was a man that was after, amen, souls being saved. He was about his father's business. And the father's business is all about the salvation of souls. If you're going to be about your father's business, talking about God your father, then you're going to be about people coming to know him, amen, coming to know the Lord Jesus Christ, amen, by the departing of their sins. You're going to be about salvation. And no telling what kind of visitation will follow that. Amen. Because when you center your heart on these things, then you will walk in, praise God, the supernatural realm as you never have before. God will speak to you directly as he spoke to Ananias about Paul. Notice everything is pertaining about salvation. Why did he speak to Ananias? And say, there's a man on a street called straight. He's blind. I want you to go there and lay your hands on him. That he might receive the Holy Ghost. That he might receive his sight. And I talked back to God. Said you know what, what man you sending me to? This man with have, have letters. Amen. To apprehend and to kill those that call on the name of Jesus. God said I know this. But he's a chosen vessel. And he's down there praying. In other words. He had an encounter with me. And why would God speak to Ananias directly like that? Because Ananias was on, praise God, the avenue of doing his father's business. Ananias was about the saving of souls. And so God spoke to him directly. A lot of us are not getting experiences from God because our minds are in the wrong places. And our heart is not in tune to the perfect will of God. And what is really the thing that God is after. But Abraham was speaking God's heart when he started innocent and praying as he was doing. 
There's no way God was going to forget Abraham and not rescue Lot. But the Bible said he remembered Abraham and rescued Lot or brought Lot out of the overflow, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. We thank God for his word. Amen. He that searches the heart. When you're praying, God is looking at your heart, not just your words. He's looking at your heart. He's going to answer you according to your heart. Praise God. But this is mainly talking to the children of God. As we keep reading, it talks about all things work together for good for those that love the Lord, those that are called according to his purpose. He ain't talking to anybody and everybody. He's talking to those that are blood washed. God is telling them, praise God, that when you pray, praise God, he that know the mind, he that searches the heart, knoweth the mind of the spirit. God's going to answer you. Even though you were not able to tell him exactly you wanted but your heart would tell him praise God he's going to search the heart and the answer is going to be given as it was given to Abraham and the answer for Abraham was deliverance deliverance to be granted to the family of Lot and God granted it God granted it repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is unto you and unto your children and unto as many as the Lord our God shall call. God bless you.